Please welcome Charity Clark. So I have notes here. It's going to be a little awkward because there's no left turn, but I'll just uh, make sure I there see is them. There is. Bring it down. Bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's you can work on it. We'll get the left turn. <laughs> We'll wait for the light turn, but uh, oh, just... Oh, look at that. We've got it. I, I, chivalrous. How heavy is that? Jeez. He heavier than a book. <laughs> right? <laughs> Luckily... Oh, and there's a gavel in it, which is great, because I always wanted to play judge. I feel like I would do a better job um, than most of the ones we have already, but... You look very official, now. Right, right? Sure. Okay. I, I agree. I'm very happy about it. So I wanted to start with just giving you a little bit of background of who I am so that you know a little bit about me. My name's Charity, as you said. Um, I am a criminal defense attorney, a mother of two kids. Um, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, I wanted to be a lawyer since I was probably in, in grade school. Originally, I wanted to be a prosecutor, but thankfully my plans didn't work out the way that I anticipated, so I didn't go to law school right away. I waited and uh, went after I worked for a while. I ended up working um, for Mark J. Victor, which apparently a lot of you know him. Um, great guy. And when I was working in his office, another attorney there encouraged me to go ahead and go to law school. So I made a deal with Mark and I said, hey Mark, I will continue helping you with this loan modification thing that you got going on if you transfer me into your criminal area and let me clerk for you. So, you know, I went ahead and did that, which was awesome. It was a great opportunity to really get exposed to criminal defense. And if you want to learn criminal defense, there really isn't any attorney. And I don't know many criminal defense attorneys, whether they love, hate, sort of like Mark, that would dispute that he is the best attorney to learn criminal defense from. So while I was there, I worked as many cases as he could give me, got really thrown into the system. Um, did as many hearings as I could, went to as many trials as I could, had my first trial in bar prep, did a lot of work. Um, but as I became more involved in the criminal justice system, I started to see how shitty it was, for lack of a better term. And in talking with Mark, I realized how quickly it had gotten so bad, so quickly. And, and even from where he was, not that it was great when he started 20 plus years ago, but over time, it's progressively and progressively gotten worse, and it continues and continues to get worse. Um, Was that pun intended? Progressive? <laughs> progressive? No, but it works out well. So I'm going to go with it. We'll pretend like I made that happen. Um, eventually, I left Mark's office after graduating law school and uh, working for him for another almost two years. And I started my own firm. So now I have my own firm. I do criminal defense and civil litigation. I throw the civil lit in there to kind of help numb the effects of getting frustrated with the criminal justice system, you know, because alcohol doesn't always help, and otherwise I might start killing people. So we, we added in civil litigation. <laughs> so that helps. Um, but each year I just see more and more, and our system continues to get worse and worse. I mean, even in the short period of time that I've been practicing, I can tell you differences from when I first started until now, new policies that have come into effect where our system has gotten progressively worse. Um, you know, it's ineffective, it's wasteful, it's out of touch with reality, and it's just overall entirely broken. And I am petrified of what it's going to become as we continue to move forward with the climate that we're in. So the question is, how do we fix this? You know, it, our system isn't just hurting those people who end up getting trapped in the system and unfortunately charged with offense, which is such a much wider net than you would anticipate. It's not just criminals, it's not people who just are bad people, it's everybody. I mean, you have just as great of a chance of, of getting charged with offense as anybody else. And the question of how we fix it is really what we need to do is start getting the public behind us to effectuate some change here. We need a public outcry. And right now, what's great is we're in a really, really good climate for it. That's what I'm really excited about with what's going on right now. 
the media has helped by sensationalizing a lot of things. I mean, I don't know how many of you have seen Making a Murderer. Um, no, nobody. It's a very, I mean, it'll make you angry. <laughs> so, and I'll be honest, I started watching it and then I stopped because I just, I was getting furious with the whole thing. And I wasn't so much furious with the amount of injustices it pointed out because I work in the system, so I see that every day. I was more infuriated with the debates that I was seeing on Facebook and social media where people were talking about this. And a lot of times people were more concentrated on the issue of whether or not the guy was actually guilty or not. And my thought is, we're dealing with a system where you're innocent until proven guilty and where reasonable doubt is all you need to get a not guilty. So if we are now in social media having a debate as to whether or not the guy was actually innocent or guilty, there's a problem that he got convicted of offenses. There's something inherently wrong, and there's something inherently wrong with the thinking of society. And that's what's driving our criminal justice system. So that's what we really need to start working on, is changing that. And with seeing the uproar of people who normally, I know, would not be offended by this whole situation or offended by the criminal justice system or really starch, uh, you know, conservatives or whatever, very tough on crime, it's really given me this renewed sense of let's get something done. I mean, everybody's outraged about the, the injustices that happened here. So I want to work on that. And somebody else just brought up, you just brought up, you know, people being fed up with the, the two-party system. Well, and it's not just the libertarians who went Republican because Rand Paul said it. Everybody's fed up with it because there's nothing that's working. So it's really a ripe situation to start changing people's minds, getting people to start thinking differently and understanding. And I think the best way to deal with that is to start educating people. Educating people that these things that you're seeing in making a murderer, the OJ thing that's all popular now and all of these other things, these are abnormal. People think that these are things that are happening just in Podo towns where corruption runs rampant or in huge metropolises like LA where, you know, obviously there's corruption there, there's been corruption there all the time. This happens every single day in our system. It is a daily occurrence, and if you work in the system, you're aware of it and you see it. And I think what winds up happening to those of us who do work in the system is we're so used to it. We kind of get numb to it. We expect it. Police, they lie on the stand all the time. Um, all the time. <laughs> and, and it's not abnormal. Prosecutors are aware of it. You know, most of us as defense attorneys report it every single time. The prosecutors are aware, but they turn a blind eye to it. They, they don't care. Um, prosecutors and police can get tunnel vision, and they're looking to convict rather than looking at what the facts say and, and where the facts are going to lead them. They'll ignore evidence that would hurt their case. I mean, I've presented prosecutors with videos of offenses, and I'm like, hey, this offense didn't really actually happen. If you watch the video, have you actually seen it? And it's a video that was in their discovery, and they're like, no, I haven't bothered to watch that yet. Well, here's the video of the offense. You think you'd want to check that out, but they don't. Um, and that's normal. They overcharge to force pleas. Yes. Do prosecutors get paid by the conviction? <laughs> you think so, but they apparently so. not. Yeah, it's 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 odd. I haven't quite found other than that. They, you know, a lot of them drink the Kool Aid. Why they go on this way that they do? You know, ego is probably a big thing. They don't disclose evidence that hurts their case. They don't disclose Brady material, which is just anything that might impeach a state's witness or a police officer. I mean, and that's gotten even worse than it was before. The, the disclosure of Brady material is a huge, constant fight, but it's getting even harder and harder to get a, a police officer's record to see what's going on. And, and my opinion is I don't understand why that's not public record. If a police officer's lied on the stand previously, why doesn't the public know about that? Why don't we have a right to know about an officer's misconduct? Why is it hidden? Why is it private? They're a public servant. Because the unions protect them. <laughs> yes. Well, because their home address uh, puts them in absolute freaking danger if that gets out. Right? But they're not their home address, just the question of whether or not it doesn't have to be face. 
name and their names out there on everything else and every police report they're in. Everything's a balance. Yeah. Balance. Yeah, everything is a balance, and, and I'll get to that. I, I'm not. This let me clarify. This is not a bash on criminal justice uh, workers, on police officers at, at all, and it's not to say that all of them are bad. They're not. There's plenty of good ones, but there's also an argument that I think gets ignored that the bad officers who aren't reprimanded or taken care of and the bad prosecutors who aren't reprimanded and taken care of, they create a environment in which the good officers are walking into a hostile situation because people, all that's getting publicized are these bad officers, right? We're not, I mean, we try and publicize the good officers, but, you know, people that want to hurt a police officer, they're like, well, that's their job. But then we're publicizing all the bad officers, and things aren't happening enough. So then, what do we do? We we create this environment of fear, and society's got this environment of fear related to law enforcement now that then puts good officers in danger because they're walking into the situation where it's automatically hostile just because they're wearing a uniform, and that's not good either. So these are the types of things, the types of stuff that I'm talking about that we need to bring out. Stop. The polarizing effects, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, of whether police are good or bad, and let's start logically thinking through what is going on and how we deal with this, and really seeing how these problems affect both sides of the fence. They affect everybody. Um, what, what I think the biggest problem is, and especially in Arizona, is we have a system that is very concerned with appearing tough on crime. That's a big thing. You hear it all the time. Tough on crime. Tough on crime. We want to be tough on crime. And I get it. Try and hurt one of my two kids, and I will show you tough on crime. Right? <laughs> but that doesn't just cover everything. It's not a blanket that you can wrap yourself up in so that you don't have to think about the future consequences of what tough on crime does. And that's what's happened. That's where we're getting screwed. So everyone's getting hurt by this entire process. Those people who want tough on crime, I'm going to explain to you how that's screwing them up. Um, and it's hurting the people, obviously, who are trapped in the system who don't deserve to be. And at the end of the day, we're not actually tough on crime. That's the end of it. We're not. When it comes to convictions and what I can do for somebody who is somebody you certainly do not want out on the street, it's amazing because of how shitty we do with other stuff. So we can claim tough on crime and we can post all of these things in the media, but at the end of the day, what's actually happening? That's the question. And that's what I think people need to be educated on is, is what's going on. Forget all of the sound bites that you're hearing and, and the statistics. Let's look at how this actually goes. But well, we're home to the world. I mean, the, the country's toughest sheriff. Oh, God. <laughs> Super Tut, who's also undergoing all of those investigations himself for that tough on crime thing. Um, yeah, but still, there's a bunch of shit going on with him, and there's a bunch of problems with Maricopa County Attorney or Maricopa Sheriff's Office that create other issues. And the way that he handles the jail also creates issues with recidivism, which, if we're talking about tough on crime, the goal is not just let's just punish people, but I would hope the goal is. Let's fix the problem and stop the crime. I mean, sure, we can punish people all day long after they commit an offense, but if we don't actually do things that help stop future offenses, what's the point? What are we protecting? What are we doing? So how do we fix this? All of this is a politically driven issue because the county attorneys, the sheriff, everybody is driven by votes, they're driven by uh, public support. So that's why I'm talking about educating the public, getting the public to understand that just what you see in those sound bites, it's not real. Um, it doesn't follow through with everything. You get to see bits and pieces, but you don't get to see the whole thing. Private attorneys really get probably the best opportunity to see everything. Prosecutors, they get a splat. I mean, police, first of all, they, they get when there's the arrest, right? And then after that, outside of, of whether there's a conviction or not, they really don't follow it because they've got other things to do, right? Prosecutors, 
they go through that one case. They don't know the offender outside of that one case. They don't know what happens to the offender after that one case. And even public defenders get stuck in that area. Private attorneys, that's where I feel like I have a unique opportunity here, I follow them all the way through. I get return business, so I know what worked and what didn't work. You know, I get to, to see them. My clients will follow up with me and tell me how they're doing, or they'll come back if they're not doing so great. So that's an opportunity to really explain to the public, this is what happened. This is how these things impact actual offenders and impact our actual system. So explaining to the common everyday person what happens with the tough on crime and what that actually means and what I'd like to change it to is instead of tough on crime, let's start being smart on crime, okay? Let's start being smart about how we deal with this. Let's not just throw something out there because it sounds good in the beginning and then not worry about how it follows through. <clears throat> you know, and, and in Arizona, it starts getting really difficult because uh, especially for liberty groups, we're a very red state, very conservative, and it can be very difficult. And what we wind up doing is we have extremes, lots of extremes, and what you hear is the extreme on one side and the extreme on the other side, and no solutions ever there because we're so concerned with the extreme, and that extreme opinion oftentimes can shut down the conversation right away. One of Mark's favorite uh, art articles that he does is legalizing all drugs, legalizing methamphetamine, right? And people read that, and some people read it because they're shocked. They're like, well, why would you legalize methamphetamine? And if you read through his entire article, here's the entire argument, it makes sense. There's a lot of logic behind it. There's a lot of sense behind it. it. It actually could be a really good thing. But unfortunately, what it does to people who are emotionally connected to the idea of drugs, it shuts them down, and they don't want to listen anymore. They're done. You legalize methamphetamine, you're a freaking idiot. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. So coming up with options that actually work um, that draw everybody together and can unite people behind one cause and show them if we take small steps, then we can start showing solutions to get to bigger steps. So maybe the solution is we legalize all drugs, right? But we're not going to get there by starting with a campaign that says legalize everything. It's totally cool. Let's just let everyone have that. They're not going to listen. If we start with smaller steps, then we start moving people as they see results into the solution that might be better, that seems more extreme right now because of where we're at. So that's what I'm looking to do. So when I started thinking about this, I, I wanted to go on to some specific topics to talk to you all about, to, to explain some areas specifically and show you how the justice system works and how we can work on those ones. There's so many. <laughs> It's, there's so much. It's it's a uh, it's a lot. And and since um, I don't even think this bar has enough alcohol to handle going through all of those, and <laughs> there's a lot. There's still just not enough. Uh, and you guys probably want to get home at some point. I thought I'd just pick a couple of topics that are really at the forefront for me, at least personally, where I see a lot of issues to kind of demonstrate it. And they both kind of fall under this issue of overcharging. That's a huge issue with Arizona. We overcharge like crazy. Um, I just saw two articles today as I was actually preparing um, to come here and talk that really illustrated the point. The first one, and I don't know if any of you have seen it, uh, there's a Mesa kid. He was charged with 60-some counts of indecent exposure, and one, which is class one misdemeanor, and then one count, I hear people laughing, so they must know. And one count of harmful, uh, distributing harmful material to a minor, which is a class four felony. Now, I don't know if there's a dangerous crime against children aspect on that or not, but we'll get into what that means, too, later. This was a high school prank. This kid, Red Mountain High School, yep, see, you heard it. I mean, it's ludicrous, right? This kid... He's a high school football player, 18 years old, an idiot for sure, uh, and he's dared by his friend to expose his penis in the group picture, the group football picture. So he's there 
with a bunch of teenage boys who are all like, this will be super funny. I mean, good thing. There's a lot of guys in here. You all were teenage boys. I'm pretty sure you understand this whole mentality. I don't know that I do. But it was super funny, right? So he does it. Well, the school doesn't catch it. Because I guess they're not going through with a magnifying glass to see oh, whose penis is out. Cool. Well, it was a big picture. <laughs> <laughs> the big picture. That's not commentary on anything else. Um, so at the end of the day, it ends up getting into the yearbook and then put on a flyer and passed out at a football game. And everybody gets it. Uh, yeah, people actually get it. <laughs> I don't know who reported this, but somebody reported it to the police. And so, of course, what do they do? They, they charge it. And they charge him excessively. I mean, the 60 some counts of indecent exposure is related to the fact that everybody, whoever was around there, I mean, and there's issues with that charge, because if you're daring him, I mean, one of the elements of that is there has to be some sort of offense. Somebody has to be offended. And if you've dared him, clearly you're not offended by the fact that his penis is out. But regardless, and, and then the harmful material is related to the fact that it's distributed. So, was what he did inappropriate? Sure, we can say it was inappropriate. Was it stupid? Most definitely. Was it criminal? No. Does it rise to a class four felony sex offense? No. That's, hell no, that's ludicrous. That is ludicrous. And this seems extreme. It's not. Charges like this happen a lot. They just don't always get sensationalized in the media because it's not nearly as funny. You know? Uh, ruining people's lives isn't always as funny as this comes off to be, but that's what we're doing. We're ruining his life. Because even if this gets dismissed, that's on his record for the rest of his life. Why wouldn't the distribution charge be against the school? Or their that's school? the next point I was going to make. And so the point of it, I mean, here we're charging him for the, what, for the appearance of being tough on crime? But you can't even make the stupid things stick. Because the distribution, I mean, ha harmful materials, you have to either dis distribute it somehow, or you have to make it available. Him being in the picture with his penis out, obviously didn't do that. You maybe should charge the school officials. I don't know. But, or, how about we just don't charge anyone with a criminal offense for a school prank, and we tell the kid there's some other repercussions at the school, or whatever. Yes, but running his entire life with this, because even when this gets dismissed, this kid's always going to have a record that he was arrested and charged for a class four sex offense. Always. We don't have expungement in Arizona. That's something I don't think people understand either. And, and while that's going on, these same people are wanting everybody to use the same restroom. <laughs> and that's a whole, I mean, that's a whole other situation we won't get into here, but the, the issue is, this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous, and it's a waste of resources. And that's the other point we're going to get to, because there may be some people out there that are like, well, that kid took a choice, and so therefore he needs to bear the consequences of it. Well, he's not the only one bearing the consequences. We are. So it seems like everyone, at least in this room, agrees this is like ludicrous, so... What's in it for someone to do that? That's all I, I always want. The appearance of tough on crime. And we're coming out of Mesa. Mesa has a habit of doing things like that. They want to play to their constituents. Think about what Mesa is. Mesa is a very um, religious, uh, Mormon primarily area. Yep. Sex is a big taboo topic. So therefore, in that area, the way the police run and the way things are, are dealt with and you can see this when you practice how different areas handle different offenses. You can tell what those areas are made up of and what the typical constituent is. So that's what it is. It's a political game. And this is why I'm saying education is so important because people don't get it. And those people who actually think this is a problem, they need to understand how it affects them. Okay, because they could give a flying rat's ass about the 18-year-old boy whose life is going to be ruined because of this. Sad but true, but it affects them too. I mean, you're wasting the county's resources on this, and there are real crimes out there, real crimes that we need to deal with, okay? 
The second one was uh, Cochise County has uh, changed their rules on prosecuting drug mules. So typical drug mules, a lot of drug mules will be minors, kids. They're easy pickings, they're easily manipulated, money seems like a huge thing to them, they don't think through it, so that typical policy has always been catch them. What's a drug mule? Drug mule. So okay. somebody, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, okay. <laughs> so typically what law enforcement had been doing is they would take them, seize the drugs or the money, release the kids. They didn't want to waste the resources on prosecuting these kids. Not to mention what's the point, because they're a dime a dozen. I mean, you, you prosecute one, they're going to come up with another one. What, what, who are the kids again? These are the drug mules. They're usually um, Mexican natives who are then paid money by the cartel right. to... Yeah. Or indigenous people calling all the people down on the reservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be it too. So they're now charging them with the offenses. And they're not just charging them, but they're charging them as adults. So these are minors and they're electing to charge them as adults, which is something else we could talk about if I had more time. The way that we can charge kids with adult offenses. Um, there's two ways. One is when they're of a certain age, 16, 17, we can charge them as an adult, and then there's an option to throw it back. And then the other way is just wait till they turn 18, because we don't have to charge them right away. So they commit an offense at 14, let's wait four years, They and it happens. I'm not kidding. And then we're going to charge them 18 as an adult, and we're going to apply adult statutes to them and we're going to apply adult penalties to them because the statutes are based on the offender at the time of conviction while based on the victim at the time of the event. That seems like a little bit. Doesn't it though? A little bit? Yeah. No, they've upheld those <laughs> as constitutional, but disgusting for sure. And I've had multiple cases where they've waited until somebody's turned to an adult, and it's and it's a policy in Maricopa County on a lot of offenses to wait until somebody turns an adult because once they then turn an adult, the defense attorney doesn't have the option to say to petition the court, which is what's happening with with this one case from Cochise County, to have it removed to juvenile court. So you can petition the court and say, look, it's in the interest of justice to remove this to juvenile court. And the argument for these drug mules is. Well, they can be rehabilitated, they can be taught English, they can be shown that there's other options out there besides trafficking drugs. Now, the county attorney there says that that doesn't make any sense because these kids don't actually have a real problem. If they were addicted to drugs or alcohol, then there'd be a problem that we can fix. But he says the problem here isn't something we can fix. His exact quote was, they're just poor and desperate. So we can't fix that. So the solution is obviously to prosecute them as an adult and toss them into prison and saddle them with all of the things that you'd get as an adult and move on, right? But the question again, in relating this back to my entire point, is how does this actually affect society? And, you know, people who are very upset and, and we're wanting to build a wall and all of that about immigration, fine if that's your position. But how does this really affect you? I mean, you want to build a wall, you want to keep immigrants out, but yet you want to house them for, you know, for transporting drugs? You want to pay their housing? for them to stay here because they're not reimbursing the jail, that's for damn sure. And do you want to create a cycle where they can't get out of it? Or do you want to give them an opportunity to be a contributing member either here or in Mexico or wherever the hell you want them to be? Those are the options and we're choosing, well, let's be tough on crime, so let's just lock them up. And it doesn't make sense. Now, this brings me back to drug offenses and, and an issue that I think is really easy to kind of grasp as far as how the system works and how it's so broken. A good example for it, because there's so many drug cases and drug offenses and whatnot. So, like I said, the, there's that argument, legalize all drugs, but that's very polarizing. So people move away from, from that. So, what we want to talk about 
is how the way drug prosecutions are really harming society. And there's some talk about that, but I don't think we get deep enough in it. We really don't. People don't get educated. There's this question about, oh, who profits from it and blah, blah, blah. But what we're not understanding is if our goal in the criminal justice system is to deal with crime and to stop crime or to help society get better, we're doing the exact opposite with prosecuting drug offenses. And it's a great example. So the way most of these work is Maricopa County, they'll target anyone. A small user, huge dealer, and let's be honest, the small user, that's easier. Because you can find them a lot easier, you can prosecute them a lot easier, you can get a conviction a lot easier, so your numbers a lot higher. So you are certainly tough on crime. Look at how many drug convictions you've gotten in the last year. Lots, right? But let's look at what those convictions actually are. So police will target these smaller offenders because it's an easy way to up numbers, which makes the public happy because we're tough on crime. Once they're then arrested and the charges are submitted, they can either be charged right away or they can be charged later because we got a seven year statute of limitation on any felony offense. So we'll talk about happen, what happens when you charge later. Say when we charge somebody right away, what happens then is they're sent to a place called EDC or RCC, the Early Disposition to Disposition Court. So the goal is because there's so many of these offenses that we're pumping through the system and draining the system, we had to figure out a great way to expedite these. So we've got EDC and RCC. What happens with EDC and RCC is the prosecutor then pumps out a generic plate. They get a sheet that says charge, how many priors, and then they pump out a generic plea based on that, and that's the policy. They don't even have to read the facts of the case. They don't have to know anything about it at all, and that's what happens. And, and then, as defense attorneys, we go in and we get our discovery, which in these courts is limited to the police report. If you want anything more than the police report, you're met with, well, then you have to go to trial division, which means you leave EDC or RCC and you go to trial division. When you go to trial division, to do that, you have to reject the plea that's on the table. It's a tantalizing plea for most people because some of them are looking at mandatory prison. In fact, most of them are looking at mandatory prison and it may be a probation plea. But I don't know if they have any defenses because I can't get the recording from the officer's interrogation. I can't get the video from